Hello, everyone. Welcome to a special episode of Christian's Colloquy. As you can see, I am not alone. I have some friends with me, and you can see these friends. I have my friend Cameron here, my friend Merrick here, and if you were watching my channel consistently, as you should be, uh, you would have saw an interview a couple weeks ago when I interviewed Cameron, and on that interview, we mentioned that Cameron and Merrick had a debate coming up. That debate happened last week, I believe on Tuesday, I think, and uh, they yes. were debating the topic of, is Jesus the God of the Bible? Is that correct, guys? Yes. I think so. I, it was, that was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. <laughs> I, I did watch the debate. I just want to make sure I got the, the line right. So they were in the debate, and I watched it. It went well. I think it went very well, but we're going to have a time now where I will give these two the opportunity to perhaps go over some of the issues of the debate, some of the questions, maybe unpack some of the statements and arguments a bit more, just so that you, my audience, and whoever happens to be watching this can perhaps learn a little more about Jesus's divinity, the Trinitarian God of the Bible, and how to hopefully respond to Unitarian arguments against Jesus's deity. So that's my little intro. I'm going to leave it to you two to really run the show here. I'll interject with a question or a statement if need be, but I am content to just listen and learn tonight. So maybe you two want to jump in, maybe say hello, introduce yourselves, and then go wherever you want to go tonight. Sure. Uh, my name is Cameron. I was on your show a little over a week ago at this point. Uh, very, very enjoyable podcast. Uh, maybe the best interview I've ever gotten, and I've gotten one total interview so <laughs> oh, <yeah>. excellent <laughs> high yes. praise <laughs> yes uh yeah so we were looking to uh, unpack the issues here uh sure merrick's looking for the yeah. same thing <laughs> mm -hmm. yep so i'm merrick uh, i enjoy discussing this topic i'm a really big fan of christian colloquies uh, YouTube channel. It's, it's a really good channel, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you. Thanks for coming on, guys. All right, so maybe I, I think uh, we were going to perhaps discuss or unpack some of their arguments. I don't know if you guys wanted to lay out perhaps what went down in the debate, talk about your side a little bit, or just jump into uh, unpacking and maybe exploring and responding to some of their arguments now. So wherever you want to go, the floor is yours. Yeah, I, I guess we can lay it out chronologically how it went. Uh, we laid out our case. We started out with an argument from monotheism and an argument from the Yahweh's creatorship. Uh, Yahweh alone is the creator. Jesus is called the creator. Therefore, Jesus is Yahweh. Uh, we ran that argument, and then we ran some arguments from abduction, which is an inference to the best explanation. It's an argument form that is an inference to the best explanation. And by running this abductive argument, by looking at all these verses and saying, these verses make a great deal of sense in light of what we just presented, uh, we laid out some verses that describe Jesus being worshipped, Jesus performing miracles in his own name, Jesus uh, carrying out the uh, activities that Yahweh alone carried out in uh, salvific history, like the Exodus. Uh, and then uh, at the end, we presented an argument from penal substitution. Uh, God is infinitely just and infinitely offended. We have an infinite debt and we are infinitely guilty. Uh, only an infinite person can satisfy this, this uh, penalty. Uh, so therefore, since Christ did satisfy God's justice, Christ's death is described as a propitiation, which is a satisfaction over and over again in the New and Old Testament. Uh, Jesus uh, drinks the cup of wrath for us. He uh, fulfills God's wrath uh, that's described in Romans 3 and in Romans 3.25. He's described as being the propitiation for our sins that we receive through faith. Uh, in John 2, he is described as a propitiation. Douglas Moo argues that in a lot of these contexts, the uh, Gentile and the uh, Roman audience would read these in terms of the sacrificial systems that they encountered. So you can't purely say, well, hey, the, uh, the uh, sacrifice, sacrificial system in the Old Testament was purely expiatory. It took away guilt. That's part of it, certainly, but 
there also is this propitiatory aspect that occurs in the Passover, for instance, that even the expiation has to do with God's uh, satisfying uh, his wrath against human sin. And so we laid out this picture of the uh, Trinitarian mechanics of salvation, and then we closed. Uh, from that point, they, they offered a rebuttal, their rebuttal to Colossians. From what I recall, it wasn't really that substantial in the cross-examination period. Mark can maybe correct me on that. Yeah, it, 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 it wasn't uh, very strong at all. It, it, they, they kind of gave, Brandon kind of gave a little bit of a vague uh, understanding. You know, this, this could be the new creation. Here it's referring to the heavenly host, the angelic rank. So it's it's kind of more about Jesus uh, forming them and working within them. And they brought up of, of the different prepositions being used and how it's uh, Christ made all the things in the heavens and earth. Um, I, I really wasn't impressed. It would have been helpful if I knew from the get-go what exactly their exegesis of this verse was because it was a little vague and that was kind of hard to deal with especially in the cross examination you might notice um yeah. but overall no i was i wasn't impressed with it yeah that's mostly what i was talking about was the uh like during the rebuttal i don't actually even think they laid out you know the the argument from in prepositions and uh the argument from uh the, the correct translation of a uh, creation uh, or create in uh i think it's verse 16 i would have to at the uh, passage in front of me again, uh, being a point, which was interesting. I never heard that argument before. Their answer to our argument from penal substitution was basically to say that, well, there's other atonement theories, <laughs> which no one denies, but right. it certainly is an aspect of the atonement. And that came up later in the debate, and we'll get to that. Uh, the other arguments were they, they, they took what I was saying uh, as a deductive argument, and they tried to get rid of uh, the deductive force of the uh, verses I was pulling, and that was fine. I mean, they, they could do that because that wasn't how I was arguing. Uh, and yeah, that, that was pretty much it for the uh, rebuttal period. I think for the uh, introductory opening statement period uh, we can actually look at their slides uh, you want to pull that up christian yeah slide share that i think i can here let's see if i can share my screen yes i can look at that and beautiful here. are we they are very here? very yes okay I, I will say I, I liked their, their opening statement. It was very well formulated. And Andrew is a heck of a speaker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Very, very quick. And, I, you know, I can't fault him for that. That was actually a tour de force in a lot of ways. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So here were their four uh, main goals in the debate, showing that the unchanging God of the Bible is not a man. Jesus is a man, therefore, you know, Jesus can't be the God of the Bible. By showing that Jesus' role shown to be something distinct from one God, from the one God, by showing that the way in which the Bible speaks of God and Jesus is only consistent with them being two different individuals, by showing that the God of the Bible is a single person and that this person is none other than the Father, which whereby excludes Jesus from being the one God. Okay, so I think, yeah, that's pretty much is self-explanatory. Hmm. Should I move on here or yes. would you? Okay, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the meats and, you know, the actual verses. Yeah. I, uh, Yohei Badwe, I've never actually heard it yeah. pronounced No, that neither way. have I. Yeah, yeah we, we were going to have the topic, is Jesus Yahweh? But he wasn't mm -hmm. comfortable with saying that. So we went with this topic. Right, yeah. interesting. Hmm. I, I'm sure I actually didn't pronounce that right, but let's let's just <laughs> assume I, I'm I'm not trying to be offensive. I I I, I thought that was that was interesting, and you know I learned something, so I, I'm not mm -hmm. not upset at that at all. Right. Uh, so yeah, these are the verses that he brings up: Malachi three six, for I Yahweh do not change. 
uh, yeah, I mean, that's sort of a standard proof text that people who appeal to the uh, doctrine of at least an intrinsic characterly uh, mutability to Yahweh. I mean, it seems like in Malachi 3, 6, the immediate context is God's covenant faithfulness, which is implied by immutability, but this doesn't seem to be that great of a proof text for their position, but, you know, we'll sidestep that. Yep. Numbers 23, 19. <laughs> that, 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 that was more of a, more of, that, that'll come up. Let's just say that. Yeah. Uh, James 1, 17. Every perfect gift is from above, or the Father of lights, if there is not variation or the slightest hint of change. Yeah, I mean, that also probably refers to God's disposition, but you know, that's fine. I, I think that immutability in the classical sense is a good explanation of these verses. And obviously, I'm someone who holds to the strongest doctrine of, of immutability that you possibly can. So I have no problem with any of this. Now, in contrast with Jesus, who is a man, again and again, we read that he is a human being, the man of sorrows in Isaiah 53. And in John 8:40, Jesus says, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the, the truth, which I heard from God. Okay, so here is a syllogism. God is never a man. Jesus is a man. God is never Jesus. So this is interesting. It is very uh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, A, he's supporting premise one mainly from how it came up was from Numbers 23, 19. And as you noted during the cross-examination, even if Numbers 23, 19 does apply to Yahweh in some sense, essentially, like, that doesn't support a stronger proposition that God is never a man, <laughs> which, which again, is irrelevant because that's not, not what the incarnation yeah. is about at all. But even, even with that, Numbers 23, 19 does not support that strong of a premise. Great. And if I recall from the debate, that's where Merrick mentioned how uh, when you read the full verse, and there was some discussion on that, it seems to be in the context of God is not a man, that he should, I, I believe it was lie or change his mind, something to that effect yeah. where it was getting at his actions. Lie and, and then it was repent. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't very happy with, I mean, he did say he wasn't intentionally being dishonest, and I, I believe him, but... Um, it would have been nice if he would have quoted the entire verse. This is from the ESV. God is not a man, comma, that he should lie. And I understand there's not that emphasis on, you know, commas yeah. and stuff in the Hebrew. But, or a son of man, that he should change his mind. Has he said, or will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? So immediately, just exegetically, it's comparing God to sinful humanity that, uh, you know, lies, changes its mind, says he'll do something, and then won't fulfill it. So that's the kind of man that it's comparing God not being to. So even in a very, you know, steel manning this argument hardcore, taking it at a very surface level, Jesus isn't even the kind of man that would say you do something and then not do it or lie or say, right. speak something and then not fulfill it. So there, th this, ar this objection or uh, argument is, is wrong on so many different levels. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's, that's an important aspect of it, because when they offered, when I pressed them, and I didn't do this good enough in the cross-examination period, when I pressed them uh, on their definition of immutability, it was that, that God is not capable of any uh, changes that involve uh, variations in his intrinsic uh, and essential attributes. Uh, I, I mean, his his essential attributes, not necessarily intrinsic attributes, but these would be things like his goodness, his faithfulness, his honesty, uh, his omnipotence, obviously. Uh, and if you really think about that, at least the picture of Jesus that we get after his exaltation, Jesus is immutable in that sense. Jesus is the same uh, yesterday, today, and forever, right? Uh, and that means that Jesus is locked in to the goodness of his human character. Jesus is such a one that his human character uh, is intrinsically perfect. And Jesus is the sort of person that could say, I am not a man like you that I should lie. But he's 
not a man like us because he's like us in all things except sin. And that's the source of his, uh, in, that's the source of man's general infidelity. I think Adam before the fall, uh, you could say that, yeah, he, he definitely is capable of keeping a lot of promises and you would trust him to keep those promises because he has supernatural gifts. But if Adam was confirmed in that state, if Adam completed the covenant of works and was confirmed by the beatific vision, you could literally tell Adam anything and he would honestly keep it because he has the face, he's beholding the God of face, uh, God's face. And by beholding God's face, he knows that every other thing is infinitely less good than that. And he can't even remotely choose to do anything contrary to that. And so, again, this is not talking about man and his essence. In fact, it seems that if God became a man, it wouldn't involve a change in his intrinsic properties, uh, his intrinsic essential properties like goodness. God wouldn't be less good if he became a man. It honestly seems like it's challenging his omnipotence to a certain extent to say that God couldn't become a human being that didn't, that, that couldn't sin. <laughs> yeah. I would be curious to know if hypothetically Jesus uttered, uh, I'm not a man that I should lie, you know, would, would they take that as we should deduce docetism from this or would yes. they just take a more plain reading? Oh, he doesn't, possess the depraved man attributes of lying and changing his mind and stuff. Right. And, and I think, uh, Merrick, you, you just said a phrase there that came up quite a bit in the debate and a few others, and we were talking about that earlier, this uh, use of the phrase, the plain meaning. And it, from my perspective, as admittedly not an expert on these, these issues, I'm, well, I'm pro I'm, I've read a bit on these issues and I had to write You're about it for school, but, uh, and I have a shirt that claims that I'm an expert, but that, that seems to be the, the basis for a lot of the argumentation here. Definitely the syllogism that we're, we're supposed to take these sections of verses, have the plain reading and then draw a conclusion from that plain reading. But I think what we're getting at here is, and what Merrick and I talked a bit about after is that this, this plain meaning and using that, that could be a, a sword or a knife that cuts both ways where if you approach other verses and have the same plain meaning uh I, I i don't know if we were joking about that or if you if you wanted to talk about that but a passage in exodus where at least in in the english where it reads uh god is a man of war we were talking about that briefly where if you just read that in the plain reading you you have this uh this statement that god is a man of war but of course yeah. in the context we we can uh surmise that it's not making a statement about God being a man who took to the battlefield, but uh, he is the, he's someone who fights on behalf of Israel. And in that context, uh, he defends them against Egypt and Egypt's army. So I, I think that that plain reading came up a lot. And for me as a listener, that, that made sense in the moment, but the more you think about it, the more you approach verses like these and think about other verses, you see how you, you still got to back that up. You can't just say plain reading and move on and think you've won where like you guys are saying, there's a context, there's a, uh, a greater context, there's immediate context, greater context, and then the realities of language and how it's used. So I, I think that's help, uh, helpful to, to bring out now. And certainly I'm glad you guys walked us through a bit of these verses here. Definitely. Yeah. And you take that plain reading on the Exodus 15, 13 and the ESV, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. If you take that even farther and do what they did and just read the Lord is a man without the qualification of war, it's, right. you, you get in even more trouble. So, Yeah, that's a great point. Where if you just read the Lord is a man and you cut, cut it out from the context, you'd have a pretty clear statement that someone could put into a, a syllogism and say, the Lord is a man, Jesus is a man, therefore, bada boom, bada bing. Of course, it wouldn't work quite like that, but it's that that sort of argumentation I think uh, you really need to drill down and I'm glad you guys are and have been doing that. Yeah, commenting on that further, I, I called it in my uh, reaction or reflection posts as mm. I've been calling them. Uh, th they made a similar argument with Isaiah 44 that that was the reason why they couldn't accept our reading of Colossians, for instance, is that Isaiah 44 excludes that uh, and I, I called it the uh, seed, the seed of doctrine argument, right? 
uh, that this is the seed of doctrine and we have to read other verses through that. They made a similar argument from the uh, ending of John where it says these things are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the son of God. Uh, and that therefore whatever's being said in John that even remotely implies that Christ is God uh, that can't be meaning that Christ is God because the purpose of the gospel is to say that he's the son of God. Uh, the thing what we're doing is we're saying, well, lots of people are called the son of God. You can't merely look at that and saying, well, it's, it's trying to convince us of a rather mundane thing. No, it's, it's trying to convince us of something important. And we need to know why that's important and how we know why it's important and why Jesus is the unique son of God is by looking at the other portions of John. And if you look at the other portions of John, uh, it certainly seems like it's compatible with wisdom literally becoming Jesus. It doesn't seem like you can say that Jesus is the exemplar of wisdom, that he is the one who resembles him to the, uh, uh, in him I'm using metaphorically, not that wisdom is a literal person. Right. Uh, to, to it, it seems like if you're reading what John's saying, that John is, uh, Jesus is describing having experiences uh, with wisdom, uh, with God before he is uh, born. He describes himself, uh, Peter describes him as knowing all things. Uh, all of these point to wisdom literally being Jesus, or the word literally being Jesus. And without getting on too much of a tangent, because we're, you know, dealing with this PowerPoint here, what we're doing is we're looking at the whole passage, we're looking at the whole book, and we're saying that this seems like it's pointing one direction. Uh, I don't think that we can really realistically read this the way that they're reading it. So whatever Isaiah 44 means, it can't be excluding uh, multiple persons uh, being uh, constitutive of the Godhead. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And I would be curious. I would never argue this way, um, but that, how, how do you word the seed of doctrine uh, yeah. argument? Yeah. If, if we take that and we apply it the other way, what if we say, well, we have this verse in Colossians 1 that teaches us X doctrine. So we have to interpret Isaiah 44 the other way. It just seems like you have to assume some conclusion out of these texts, and then you can say, well, I must interpret these other texts. Uh, in this light, but why can't we just say we do it the other way? Um, I, I, I don't I don't think that way of arguing is any, any good way to do it. Right. I mean, what they would say to, to be sympathetic and charitable to them is that the seed of doctrine has to be something that speaks clearly to the subject in mind. So, for instance, in Roman Catholic and Protestant debates over justification, uh, the Protestants would say that uh, Paul is the seed of doctrine for justification and James isn't. And the reason for that is that James doesn't clearly speak to justification over and over again in his letter, while uh, Romans seems to be exclusively about justification. And Romans is the seed of doctrine for justification. And they would say that Isaiah seems like it's clearly speaking about uh, creation, and you can read a uh, Colossians as being about something other than than uh, creation. Like the church or creation of renewing our hearts. Right. And, and yeah, I think that wasn't something that was brought up in the debate, and I probably should have, uh, is that Colossians, most commentators recognize that the Colossian heresy was some form of proto-Gnosticism, and so if it is creational, it, it this is a seed of doctrine for describing creation that Jesus isn't sort of this emanation that uh, is a reflection of, you know, an evil deity or something of that sort. Uh, then it seems like the uh, seed of doctrine actually would very, it would more clearly be Colossians than it would be Isaiah, honestly, because Isaiah gets on this subject really tangentially while Colossians is exclusively about uh, Christ's supremacy the supremacy that he has by nature and the supremacy that he gains through his incarnation and the subjugation of all things under him. 
Right. Yeah, yeah so. that, that was an, an interesting point. And again, for me as a, as a listener thinking about that Colossians part, it was, uh, I, I, I was glad that some questions were asked where at first I didn't understand the argument, but the, uh, and I'm grateful to your opponents that they took the time to explain and really unpack it. So, so no ill will meant there or anything. I think they did a, a fine job at trying to unpack it, but uh, it still felt like to me anyway, that uh, that wasn't exactly a way of uh, understanding the text for what it says itself, but rather it was a way to explain away the text in a sense where they had to deal with it. And now what can we believe it says where uh, I could say in my time at seminary, Colossians was one of the books I really poured into. I, I preached out of it for class and I did some hermeneutics papers on there. And in, in my commentaries, I, I consulted a wide variety. I never read anything that would really prepare me to at least encounter a viewpoint like that. And maybe I didn't read the commentaries that they read or perhaps the scholars they read, but it didn't, certainly wasn't anything I was familiar with where uh, going through the context and what different commentators and scholars had to say about what Colossians was coming from, where it was going, and what was it trying to communicate that uh, it would suddenly uh, present this, uh, this interpretation of the new creation and uh, I, I believe at one point, I think it was Andrew mentioned, perhaps it's like uh, um, Jesus uh, establishing or reestablishing the authorities in different uh, uh, geographical sections of the earth. And uh, there was a term for that, but it, it was it was all a lot to suddenly encounter for the first time in a debate like that. And it, it caught me off guard and it took me a while to get my head around it. Yeah, that's actually what my friend said when he was watching, and he said, I think it was at least interesting to hear how they would interpret Colossians. Right. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I was expecting this new creation argument uh, that they would interpret creation as literally being creation. Uh, not necessarily literally being creation, but at least something analogous to that, you know, the sort of thing that you see in Ephesians 2.10, which Brandon, to his credit, did bring up. Uh, you know, that we are uh, created unto, uh, in Christ Jesus unto good works, you know, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, and, I mean, we had several uh, several rebuttals prepared to that line of critique. I think one of the most powerful ones is that if, if this sort of creation is the type of new creation that you see in the Pauline literature, like what occurs in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, then it's affected through faith. And so if you're really, really taking this to its logical conclusion, it would mean that the demons in hell are regenerate. Ah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. I, I want to read from a commentary in Colossians by Heinrich Mayer, I believe it's how it's pronounced. Uh, they brought up, granted, how this, could, this word for creation could be kind of an arrangement of things that's going on. And so I found this commentary which specifically speaks on it, uh, he writes, throughout the New Testament in general, uh, so I believe it's pronounced the word for great, uh, denotes the original bringing forth, never merely the arrangement of that which exists. And even in such passages such as Ephesians 2.10, the relation is conceived only in a popular manner as actual creation. Yeah. Right. I actually uh, think that we can sort of uh, sidestep this debate until later, so we can... Uh, get through this uh, PowerPoint though. Sounds good. Yeah. So, so I, mo I moved it on here to additional distinctions between God and Jesus. So were there any verses here you'd like to unpack or look at? Hmm, that's an interesting one. Uh, let, let me see. Uh, with no other above him while Jesus is under the authority of God and does nothing of his own initiative. I mean, yeah, that, that was an interesting part of the debate because we uh, distinguish between the economic and ontological trinity. Uh, they didn't really think that that was justified because they're, I think at one point Brandon said, if you're reading Isaiah 44, for instance, you're not going to come to the conclusion that this is a Trinitarian text, which was really simplistic because that isn't how theology is done. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, these are, these are, uh, these are confusing categories. God has no equal while Jesus is made just like his brethren. Uh, sure. Anyhow, he's made just like his brethren in all things except sin. So in that sense, he's not really equal. That isn't even really what the verse is getting at. But, 
but sure that that isn't what we're claiming at all. Uh, God has no equals, essentially. Uh, Jesus takes on a human nature, so he can be compared to his brethren. That's an uh, important distinction that's necessary here. God is eternal, while Jesus was foreknown by God. Yeah, that means he was predestined by God to complete his mission. Uh, we would say that all three members of the Trinity covenanted uh, so that the second person of the Trinity would be sent. That doesn't mean that the uh, Son was, you know, foreknown by God in the same way that, you know, believers are. I mean, we would say that ultimately, in one sense, and, and even Dort uses this language, that in one sense, you know, uh, Jesus is the premier one who's foreknown by God, sure, but that isn't remotely contradictory to any of our argumentation. The living God, the God of the Bible, it, it's kind of, okay, yeah, the living God, the God of the Bible is immortal while Jesus died. Uh, again, <laughs> this, is, this is speaking about essential properties of the divine nature, not properties of the composite person who has a human nature and a divine nature. Right. Uh, and I, I guess I kind of skipped to the verses that I could deal with, but yeah, I mean, if you want to read up further, God knows all things while well, Jesus did not know certain things like the time of his return. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting one. Uh, I'm assuming, uh, it's actually Matthew 24, 36, because that doesn't sound like the... Uh, you know, the hour first, but I, I assume it is. <laughs> that isn't where I remembered in Matthew, but I'll, I'll look it up. Yeah, no, no, it is the day and the hour verse. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, again, there's various ways of approaching this. I mean, Jesus and John at one point is said to know all things even prior to his incarnation. So this needs serious nuance however we think about it. Uh, one, the response that most uh, people give after the Reformation is that Jesus didn't know uh, in his human nature, but he gave an incomplete answer. We give incomplete answers all the time, right? Uh, he isn't lying, but he isn't explaining every aspect of his knowledge. He's not saying, oh, well, I know this in my divine nature, but, you know, my human nature only contains that which is necessary for my task, right? right. Uh, another way to, to, to interpret this is to say that, and this is the way that most of the church fathers interpreted this, is to say that Jesus did know, but no can mean that Jesus didn't know to tell it to us. He, he knew it in his human nature because his human nature has all these infused gifts, but he didn't know it in his office as redeemer and prophet to reveal it, which I'm not saying is the best answer on earth. My preferred answer is that he could have had access to this information because he has full access to the divine attributes, but he doesn't have the use of all of them in his role as a servant. I mean, that's my, you know, distinctively Lutheran Christology at play there, but, right. you know, th there's various ways to interpret this. And even for the Unitarian, this is at least at face value, a contradiction in the Bible, because Jesus is said mm -hmm. to know all things. Uh, yeah, I mean, does not take his life from another while Jesus lives because of the Father. Uh, I mean, again, economic roles. Uh, I mean, if this is the verse I think it is, uh, sent me, I live because of the Father. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, this means that Jesus took on the role of a servant and he is receptive to what the Father has given him. I mean, that's at face value what's being discussed. Uh, we would interpret Philippians 2 in the way that most Christians throughout the centuries have interpreted it, that Jesus was God in his ultimate act of humility. He was taking on the form of the servant, which involved limitations. And this is actually uh, the image of Christian uh, charity and Christian liberty, that we are... Uh, kings and conquerors in Christ. Jesus was a king and conqueror in himself, uh, but in the ultimate act of humility, uh, Christ becomes a servant for our sakes, and we are to become servants for Christ's sake, because we have all the righteousness in the world, but we give all the righteousness in the world through our love, and that's what God 
does in Christ. Uh, and, and yeah, that seems to be what's spoken in John 6, 57. Jesus has a similar receptive role that we do. And as the premier moral exemplar for humanity, uh, God becomes like us in all things. He becomes a passive recipient of the Father's uh, grace and life-giving efficacy. I mean, I think that's honestly beautiful. I think that's the gospel in its essence, actually, is right. that we receive from, from the Father. And uh, it isn't surprising that, that Jesus would, would say that sort of thing. So I, I don't really see this as being anti-Trinitarian at all. Hmm. No, that's, that's a good word, and that's a good point. And I, I think what the sense I'm getting from a lot of these verses and supposed contradictions is that this is where when we approach Scripture, we have to realize that there's a lot going on, and we need to be prepared to dig deep into the text and understand that if Jesus were to speak, and, and you mentioned that with uh, uh, what Jesus knows, but if he were to speak in such a way where it would be 100% plain to us what is meant at all times, and he gave us the full information that he had at all times, we'd have a very different, much longer, incomprehensible book to really, really work with, where the, the realities of the biblical text and the use of language and just the way communication is done leaves us with questions like these that we have to work through. And at the end of the day, that is, I think, a mercy upon us that we're not given full information and full explanations at all time that would go beyond our our comprehension and that certainly is a theme with theology proper all the time at least in my own in my own experience right yeah. I, I think a good example of this sort of uh inadequacy i won't say inadequacy but the incompleteness of communication would be say jesus's interaction with the uh, young roller for instance hmm. uh and when he says why do you call me good uh, the Unitarians would say, well, you know, this is an example of Jesus uh, noting a distinction between him and God. But uh, I mean, if you actually read the Gospels, Jesus calls himself good uh, over and over again. So yeah, the good shepherd. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like what whatever's going on here, there's a lot of moving parts and they're just focusing on one little, you know, tidbit and they're building an entire theology off it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah, I good. think we can move on. Excellent. And, and maybe I'll make a point here for the viewers that if you're seeing these contradictions and you're, you're now struggling with them, there are a lot of fantastic resources out there that you can dig into these questions, that you can dig into these topics. Don't look at these verses and be left wondering. Ask somebody, ask your pastor, ask some, a mature Christian you know, or leave it in the comments here. I know that you too, uh, I'll have the link up and you can point people to resources, answer some questions if you have the time. But uh, whenever you see stuff like these verses put together, uh, Christianity's been around a long time. These aren't new. People have addressed them, so don't be worried by them. And it might spark a good conversation or at least thought exercise or uh, maybe a time of discipleship that uh, someone can move forward. And so thank you guys for taking the time now to unpack them a little bit and we'll, we'll keep trucking here, but I just wanted to get that out now. Yeah. Like none of us think for a second that there actually are contradictions in the Bible. In fact, I, I think that m most of the uh, serious studies that I've done have been because of the fact that at times there appear to be some contradictions, mm. but our, our faith isn't grounded on, on uh, induction. We don't look at the Bible and say, oh, you know, uh, every single verse appears to, you know, have a sophisticated answer. So therefore we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. It's more deductive that God reveals this uh, and that since God has revealed this and since God is, is truthful to this word, uh, whatever, uh, whatever contradictions appear to be the case, they aren't actually there in the original manuscripts, which is, you know, the essential aspect of inerrancy that uh, I would say most defenders of inerrancy today uh, advocate for. Obviously, there's majority text people and uh, Texas Receptus onlyist people and mm -hmm. King James onlyist, but yeah, I don't think either of us or any of those positions. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Great. Majority text onlyism is very defensible, and I'm not trying to 
fault anyone who holds that view. Uh, right. But yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah, t the typical Trinitarian responses to all these arguments will be to run a two natures Christology, which is yes. I mean, I think you need to say that up front because as you're presenting it, you're making it seem like people are holding the viewpoint that there is a confusion in the two essences, which is is exactly what the councils condemn. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, that that's a problem. Uh, to try to explain to you what that God can be, both be and not be the same thing at the same time. Well, they're trying to uh, it, at least imply that there is a, actually a contradiction here. They don't mention respect, but they're saying that oh well, uh, this uh, can't be a contradiction because uh, we do defer the respects, but they're at the same time they seem to be implying that we're not doing that. So that's interesting. I will try to be charitable to them and say that they do think that we're uh, dividing the two respects that God is man and uh, God is God. Uh, and yeah, I, I stumbled uh, there, so I'll, I'll let Mark uh, speak so I can, uh, you know, catch my breath a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, it's uh, a lot of times I hear Unitarians just right off the bat, they'll say, oh, you're, you're appealing to contradiction, incarnation, two natures. How can one person be fully God and fully man? You know, you, that, that's 200%. That's 100% too much is what they'll say, um, which is a blatant misunderstanding of what we're saying in the incarnation. Uh, and I think this is something that Brandon talks about a lot. He'll bring up the incarnation, how it's supposedly incoherent, but... I don't think uh, at any point in the debate did we hear any good reason why it is incoherent at all. Um, right. Yeah. yeah, I, and, I, I, in, yeah. Some, in some ways, I was happy about that because I expected it to be uh, substantially more philosophical than it was. And in that sense, that was one of the reasons why I was so unprepared for it is I was expecting uh, less of an exegetical debate than it ended up being, which was a good thing, by the way. Right. Uh, but so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you, uh, Merrick, that, that they didn't demonstrate that this is incoherent. And I think that when they, they did try to, when they appealed to, say, divine timelessness, uh, they completely misunderstood uh, our, our position. And I think, yeah, when, when you look at this fully man, fully God issue, it means that Jesus, uh, the divine person of Jesus has all those notes that are constitutive of being a human, every single one of them, and he fully possesses all those notes constitutive of being a divine person. And so we can say Jesus is fully man and fully God. It doesn't mean that Jesus is, you know, a square circle or anything like that, because we defer the respects. Uh, a square circle is a square and a circle in the same respect, and that's why it can't exist. That's why it's a contradiction. Hmm. Uh, that's a helpful analogy. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. Ne next. Next part. slide. Okay. Uh, actually, wait. Wait. Can you can you go I, back? As I, I can go back. The, uh, next yep. slide. All the differences or no uh, differences between a person, Jesus, and the God of the Bible, not differences between some abstract human nature and the God of the Bible. Uh, yeah, that that w was a straw man there. Uh, no one's saying that an abstract nature died for our sins. We're yeah, saying we're not it, saying this abstract, this abstract property. Like I think Brandon compared it to a color dying on his video with Carlos. He said, "Well, it sounds like they're saying just something we used to describe something died, like a color died or an abs, like one died, you know, the number one." And that's not what we're saying at all. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I we're, we're saying the person died through the human nature. We're not saying this abstract understanding or concept of. Yeah, that, that's a nice shorthand way to say it. What we're saying is that we are saying that the human nature is a human person, but we're not saying that it's a human person of its own right. It's a human person because it subsists through the divine person, which just is the divine relational subsistence, which is the second person of the Trinity, the relation of generation, as we call it. And that might seem like it's, tricky terminology that doesn't seem like the sort of thing that you could ground in the biblical text. Well, I mean, there's several things to say here. I mean, the picture, as I was discussing with Christian last Sunday, 
Uh, the picture of God that you get in the biblical text isn't necessarily the picture that anyone accepts. And that doesn't mean that the biblical text presents a wrong picture of God. It just means that that isn't its purview or its uh, intended goal. It just means that whatever God is, God, God is other than us. There is this creator-creature distinction. And so I, I don't think it's any surprise that we have to use complicated terms to describe uh, God. Uh, and th these sort of relational mode of the Godhead that we're speaking of makes a lot of sense if uh, the Father is God and the Son is God. It's, it just uh, builds off those two distinctions that fatherhood and sonhood are, are both relations that oppose each other. A father cannot be a son in the same respect that he is the son uh, is the son to the father. Uh, if he were, then he would be his own father and his own son at the same time, which is a contradiction. So, yeah, I mean, what they're getting at is, it, it isn't remotely what we were defending, let's just say that. Right. So, yeah, natures do not change, no things experience. Again, right, persons do. Uh, it, it's not an abstract human nature, it is a personal human nature, but it's not a personal human nature of its own right because it doesn't subsist of itself. It subsists because of the divine nature. Every other human nature that you can point to has an essence and its own distinct act of existence. Christ's human nature has an essence, but it doesn't have its own act of existence from itself. It has its act of existence from the divine person. So yeah, we would say that a, a person is a rational substance and a substance is a subject of existence. Since the human nature is not a subject of existence, it isn't the sort of thing that instantiates existence it is a subject of the divine existence. And so it is a substance uh, through the divine nature, but it isn't a substance in itself. And that is complicated, but we're just opposing two ideas that are presented in the scriptures, that Jesus is God and Jesus is man. Both ideas are presented side by side each other, and we have to understand both. And theologians have employed different terms to understand this, but it doesn't mean that the basic idea of what we're saying is uncomplicated because it, it is uncomplicated. It, the, the, the Bible is rather clear that Jesus is God. It is also rather clear that Jesus is man. Uh, we can hold these truths as mysteries or we can seek to understand how they coalesce. And that was the job of the creeds. They were coalescing two opposing ideas and formulating a robust and comprehensive doctrine of the uh, man and the, the, the God man of Jesus Christ. Right. That's good. Yeah. So we, we can move on now. Excellent. I said, I was going to try to slow down, uh, speed up here. So I no, will no, do that, that now. No, but I'm, I'm grateful that you're taking the time and it. And it's helpful to understand. And I think that gives some perspective into those ancient creeds and councils, how they fit into the discussion, what they were doing and how Christians today can still, find use in them. We're still asking and debating the same questions that they hammered out 1700 years ago. So it's, it's good to not only that we're definitely going through the text of scripture and analyzing these questions, but also recognizing that we're not the first Christians to deal with them. And we have these universe near universally accepted resources that we can not only appeal to in a, in a sense as a, as a secondary authority, but also just wrestle with ourselves to get more information from. So Thank you for not only providing answers, but also referencing those, uh, those ancient sources for us to work with as well. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so getting on to this, uh, yep. the Bible describes Jesus as the son of God. Again, no one disagrees, not just the son of the father. Uh, yes. Uh, taken either way. Uh, again, how they're defining God. This is an important point. How they're defining God. They're defining God as a personal noun which refers to the second person of the Trinity, the, to, to the first person of the Trinity, right? Uh, and this is the sense where, in which Paul uses the term God in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, that we have one God uh, through whom all things and uh, from whom all things are and through whom we exist and one Lord Jesus Christ uh, through whom we exist and uh, through whom all things hold together or something like that. I'm saying it off the top of my head. Right. Uh, 
And in that sense, yes, we would say that Jesus is, is not God, if that means that he is the person of the Father. But that's just a shorthand way of uh, that, that Paul distinguishes between uh, God the Father and God the Son. It doesn't mean that the uh, Father isn't the one Lord, for instance. It just means that he isn't the one Lord personally. He's the one Lord insofar as he participates in the abstract nature of lordness, or uh, which just is the divine nature, since there isn't this universal lordness that stands over and above the persons. Right. Jesus is not the son of the father, uh, son and spirit in the Bible. Uh, again, uh, not important. We're describing a unique relational role that he has to the father. And so if it said that he was the son of the spirit, that would mean that he uh, is generated by the spirit in classical terms. And so, yeah, that, that would be heretical in the creedal sense. So we don't want to say that. And if it did say that, then that would actually be committing us to a position that uh, is denied by the creeds that we are seeking to defend, really. Right. Good thing that's not in the Bible then. Mm. <laughs> yeah, right. You're right. <laughs> That's good. And, and that that's helpful. I, I think that's a, a good example. Think about that one God and one Lord where uh, if you're looking at it in a certain way, those might be exclusionary, but we need to understand what the, what the text is doing, how Paul is using those terms in his context, in his writing, and not uh, import our own understanding of those terms into Paul. And then if, if we do that all over the place, like you mentioned with the the one Lord, then we'll have all sorts of problems going both directions. We need to stay, take a step back and read Paul for what he's writing. And of course, I, I believe uh, uh, Andrew and uh, was it Benjamin were, was it Benjamin? Brandon. Was it? Brandon. Brandon, sorry. Uh, Brandon and Andrew were, I, I don't think they're trying to uh, import anything on their part, but uh, I, I think that's something we as Christians need to be aware of when we're reading the text. Let's let the text speak for itself and allow that to guide our conclusions. Right. Yeah. And I think an important point of in a uh, first Corinthians eight, which we were mentioning uh, is that, yeah, Paul is, is playing on the Shema here. Right? right. And he is actually by identifying Jesus with a uh, curious here, he is actually, if you look at the Septuagint, he's more closely identifying Jesus with the one Lord, uh, of the Shema, then he is uh, identifying the Father with the One Lord. Right. Definitely, yeah. If you look at the Septuagint in Deuteronomy 6 4, and then you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 8 8, it's, it, it's hard to deny that Paul is clearly reinterpreting the Shema in light of God's progressive revelation about his, his triune nature. Mm. Yeah, right. Again, and this is an early Pauline way of describing that. And again, we, we shouldn't be surprised that there isn't this robust, philosophically uh, defensible view of Trinitarianism, because that isn't how theology is done, at least for most theologians uh, throughout history. They've defended a, a deductivist approach to theology, and that allows us to import categories to understand these things. Uh, right. And yeah, how, how they're approaching it is... I think really unheard of in the history of philosophy and in the history of theology proper, really. Right. Interesting. That's good. Shall, shall we move on here to the next slide? Yeah. What uh, I, I just looking really quick, you were the Christ, yeah. the son of the living God. Again, if you're looking at John, you're going to get the impression that this means something rather unique and it isn't, sort of vaguely being the messiah or being god's agent it means that he is literally the only begotten son of god the express image of god and that means and that makes a lot of sense if you actually look at the passages that describe christ as the image as the word uh, because if someone reading this and understanding wisdom motifs uh, they would approach this text and they would see that oh this is actually the uh, principle of the Godhead that produces the world and upon which the world is based. Uh, the son of the living God is the image of the, the only God. And 
that can't be less than God because any created thing is infinitely far from being the sun or express image of the living God. Right. That's helpful. Yeah. So same thing here with first John five twelve. Right. Okay. So let's see what we got next. Oh, interesting. Additional <laughs> roles of Jesus that distinguish him from the God of the Bible. Wow. Yeah. We dealt with first Corinthians two, five in the debate. Again, it's also dealing with a form of proto Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. So by stressing the manhood of Christ Jesus, it's, accomplishing its goal basically there is one god sure uh there's one mediator between god and men again it's not clear whether god is being used as an abstract or common noun uh it could be used as a personal noun that's fine for there is one father and one mediator between the father and men the christ the man christ jesus like that's fine too there's nothing theologically incorrect with that uh the father is presented economically as our premier judge. It doesn't mean that the entire justice of the Trinity isn't satisfied in punishing Christ, but uh, it does mean that uh, the Father is economically the person that we look to as the judge. Uh, obviously, uh, the Father has given Christ the uh, prerogative of judging things, and that actually should point to something Trinitarian going on in the background there, but the, the father throughout both testaments is the one who's presented as having the chief prerogative of judging, and there's no issue there. Jesus is a prophet. Yes, again, right. He, he was a servant. No one disagrees there. Jesus is a priest. Yes, that was necessary for our salvation. He undertook the role of priest and offered himself up as a holy oblation to God. Uh, that was necessary for our salvation, so no problem there. Yeah. Yeah. And I would also just say it's not not only is he, uh, you know, just, he, he's not just like some other priests throughout biblical history. He's presented in Hebrews as the great high priest, um, you know. So yeah, right. That's good. And, and that's an interesting point where it seems like part of their arguments were taking common Christian doctrines and themes and then throwing them back at Christians, which I think might catch people off guard, but. I think like you guys are saying, it's as simple as saying, yes, we, we agree with this. It just doesn't lead where you think it leads, or it's just not driving at the conclusion that you want it to drive at. And it's just a matter of taking the time and thinking through things through where we could say Jesus is a priest and a prophet, but then we could look at what, what made Jesus unique in those roles and discuss how that was part of his, his coming as God incarnate to save us. So I, I think that's a, uh, Th those are bigger discussions, but again, and I'm saying this as a viewer and not particularly an expert, I could say where these, these are the types of things that might catch a person off guard immediately, but it truly is a matter of taking the time, slow down. Let's actually think about what's being said, what the claim is, and how we can still approach this text without any issue of reading it for what it says, but come away with a, an orthodox understanding of the Trinity and Christ's divinity, I don't think we're having a problem there. It's just a matter of taking the time. Yeah, I, I think you make exactly the right point here. Uh, they make great observations. All of these observations are, you know, textbook things that you'll see if you look in a systematic theology book, Christ is a prophet, priest, and king, right? Like, yeah. sure, that's, that's perfect. Uh, complete non sequitur and what they're actually intending to draw from those premises. But you know, it, it, it is true. And it's really cool that he's presenting these right. facts. But the, the, the nice thing about our gospel presentation is that God didn't have to do these things and that mm. God demonstrates his love for us and humbling himself and taking on these roles. Similarly, we don't have to do all sorts of things, strictly speaking to merit our salvation, but we should do good works one of the premier reasons that we do works besides the fact that we're commanded to and there's rewards attached to it and that sort of thing is because our neighbor needs it, right? right. There's a standard phrase in Lutheran theology that uh, God doesn't need your love, but your neighbor does. And obviously that's not exactly, you know, what's going on here. God, God does demand love from us, but the, the, the love's chief object is to neighbor. It's not to God. Faith's right. chief object is to God. It's not to neighbor. Hmm. 
that's helpful. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, have to you Lutherans and your your little sayings. All right, fair <laughs> enough. I see you. I respect that. Okay, but we'll see what they got here next. Doesn't mean there's carnal Christians out there, by the way. Right. Just <laughs> nope, that's clear. <laughs> Okay, so here we have the way the Bible speaks of God and Jesus is only consistent with them being two different individuals. Interesting point. What do we say? It's uh, very interesting. It's not, it's not like Trinitarians have distinguished between different persons in the Trinity for, you know, 2,000 years or anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah. I, I, I guess the point they're really getting at is, you know, they're, they're different beings, but as far as I can see, uh, just, just from the top of my head, looking at this slide, they're proving differences between the Father and the Son. You know, they're not numerically two, not one. Um, and they love to talk about this concept of numerical identity, but I would agree, the Father and the Son, they're, they, they are definitely distinguished. Now, whatever it means to be distinguished, in what sense they're different, that, that's, that, that's a little bit more in-depth. But just on the surface level, them being distinguished, yeah, of course, I agree with that. Right. Yeah. I mean, again, what they're getting at, they're making okay observations and they're running away with it. Yeah. Like, like let, let's look at this passage in, in Acts 4.26 against Yahweh and his Messiah. If they're just looking at, sure, the, the psalm they're quoting for, yeah, may, maybe you wouldn't come to that conclusion in a vacuum. That's fine. But uh, again, uh, how else would you stress this? Again, there's this idea that I've never seen a, a gospel sermon that lays out a really, really robust doctrine of the Trinity. That just isn't what gospel sermons are intended to do. And I think that, again, here they're, they're distinguishing between the task of the catechism and the task of, you know, the uh, fire and brimstone sermon, right? right. They, they're, they're two different things against Yahweh and his Messiah? Sure, yeah. I mean, you would you would stress the fact that his Messiah is a human person because the uh, Jews were the people who killed him. I, I mentioned Acts 2 as a good example of this. Of course he would stress uh, the manhood of Christ because they were stressing uh, the Davidic descent of Christ in Acts 2. And this sort of thing is happening in Acts 4. Uh, if you turn a theology of the cross into a theology of uh, glory by doing uh, by presenting your doctrine of God, you're doing it wrong. Uh, and I think that what, what's going on here is that they're comfortably skirting both tendencies, as I said in my my re reflection paper. Right. Uh, they're presenting Yahweh and they're presenting his Messiah. Uh, again, because they're quoting a, a psalm, uh, it doesn't matter that there's not an express distinction between them. That isn't really what's intended. It's intended to express. It's it's just saying that Yahweh has vindicated his Messiah. Uh, again, uh, the catechism will go in depth about what sort of attributes that that Messiah has. Yeah. Uh, I think that their entire religion is saying, let's look at these sermon and acts, these sermons and acts. Uh, whatever happens in these sermons is early Christianity, you know, completely. There's no other aspects of it, and let's run away with it again. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting thing because I, I was talking to a uh, Christian about this. We were talking about baptism just for a little bit, and we, we know in Acts 2, you know, baptized in the name of Jesus, you know, where's where's the Father and the, the Spirit? So even just on a surface level, we know this isn't an in-depth, treatise on all things christianity you know um so right. yeah right and, and and it wasn't intended to be uh and uh so my servant david he will feed them he will feed them with himself and be their shepherd and i always will be their god and my servant david will be their prince among them i the lord have spoken again like hypothetically any of the members of the trinity could say that statement there's nothing remotely compelling in the way of argument to that verse uh john 14 1 believe in god believe also in me again a lot of the time uh if you look in verse two in my father's house are many rooms it seems clear that whatever god is 
it's the same sort of use of God as you see in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. It's the use of God as a personal name. In my Father's house is what John 14, 2 says. It clarifies how God is being used. Clearly referring He's to the referring Father. to the Father. And the fact that Jesus is setting himself side by side the Father should tell us something because our contention is is that if an agent did this, it, it's utter blasphemy. He is robbing God of glory that is only due to him as the creator. Uh, and the principle of agency can explain this. Uh, and they, every single counterexample to this principle is just reinterpreted through that lens. Uh, the fact that, you know, angels wouldn't accept worship despite being servants like Christ and despite being sinless is reinterpreted because, oh, well, you know, it's an express kind of agent that can receive worship, just not this angel. And it, it, it just baffles my mind that this principle is, is actually taken seriously as something that's all that demonstrative of first century Judaism. Interesting. And, and here, here's where I'll, I'll, I'll jump in briefly and mention that uh, looking at these type of arguments and American, I have seen this a lot on a server we're on, but the, these type of arguments, you don't just get them from Unitarians, but these are the arguments you get from Muslims, especially we see a lot of that where, uh, and I'm not implying that uh, Andrew and uh, Brandon are Muslims, not saying that, but just when it comes to the arguments and these type of verses, you know, some of my viewers might be going and say, oh, I'll never need to worry about this. The, I'll never come across uh, biblical Unitarians as I hear some calling themselves on these issues. But these are good things to be aware of because you'll hear it from a variety of groups. And a lot of the arguments on their side are the same. And a lot of the responses that you can give and should give apply across the board where it's the, the same truth under, under assault or under scrutiny. And you can uh, learn from this hopefully and, and see how these answers have application in many different contexts. So uh, I'm sensitive to time. I don't want to run on too long. Are we okay to move on here? Yeah, for next sure. One? Okay, great. Uh, the irony of Trinitarians. I don't think we made this argument, so I think we can. Yeah, you know, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I was uh, just for a second at the end, I was accused of assuming Unitarianism by saying, you know, there's certain parts in the New Testament where God is, maybe a lot of parts, I think, where God is in reference to the Father. Um, and I, I think I basically said if that's assuming Unitarianism, you know, I don't know what to say because I don't, I don't think saying Theos in the New Testament is referring to the Father is like a core tenet of Unitarianism at all. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, that's good. And thank you for clarifying that, that you are not a Unitarian or assuming it when you say that, because that applies to me as well. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. God of the Bible is a single person, and this person is none other than the Father, which thereby excuse. I mean, we just disagree. What is a person, an intelligent individual being? We got into that earlier. Uh, again, that isn't really a bad definition, uh, but we would say that, th that there is a sense in which each of the individual persons are. We would we would rather use the term substance because being. Is, is a really, really vague term. Uh, if you actually look at metaphysics, uh, contemporary metaphysics and discussions on how being is defined, if you read someone like Heidegger, right, uh, th this, is, this is a debate that rages and rages on. So I, I think that using the term substance as subject of existence is, is a better example here. And, and if we use that terminology, we could say that each, each of the persons is a substance. Uh, but they're a substance through the divine essence. And they differ from each other because the relations uh, are not the other relations, but the persons are all fully God. And I agree that that is hard to understand, and there's all sorts of philosophical problems with that notion. Uh, but there's ways to deal with that. And, you know, I, I would be so, sort of surprised if God, God's mystery and essential essence weren't mysterious in that way. I think Aquinas actually gives an argument against Islam from that fact that uh, Christianity has has the sort of mysteries that you would expect God to will. Uh, Islam, and you know, I would say they're really, really rationalistic form of Unitarianism, Socinianism is really biblical Unitarianism, 
is really uh, just uh, rationalism uh, at play. Right, yeah. Trinitarians can see that God is a single individual being and it's plain that he acts and speaks intelligently. Uh, again, that's really vague. <laughs> uh, God is a single essence and that essence is his being, sure. Uh, but each of the persons is fully the divine essence and each of the persons right. is in each other. Uh, again, you could say that uh, this is a problem of transitivity that if a equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, right? Uh, sure, if A equals C and B equals C, then A equals B, right? That's that's an argument, but again, there's different ways of dealing with that. Some people take a relational model of identity. Others would say that there's a distinction between uh, identity following after the thing and identity following after the notion. Uh, I, Item uh, secundum rem and item secundum rationem are the Latin terms for them. Uh, and yeah, I mean, again, really, really vague. Uh, I, I don't necessarily think that Andrew did that on purpose, but it didn't help things. Right. Uh, yeah, we can skip. All righty. A few of the thousands of verses that describe God with singular personal pronouns. The nice thing about Trinitarianism is we can affirm that each divine person can say that I, Yahweh, uh, am the maker of all things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All, all three persons are each three persons. So if one person, <laughs> if one person says one thing, then that person is indeed a person. Yes. And so we could safely say these thousands of verses do not pose a problem to our position on Jesus and the Trinity. That that's that's a relief, I think we can say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because that, that's a lot of verses. <laughs> that, it, that would be a lot of verses. And while I, I appreciate where they might be coming from, perhaps in making that point, it's what it's again this issue of yeah, we're saying yes and amen to a lot of these things they're presenting as arguments. And it's just a matter of how are we going to grab hold and where are we going to run with these uh these points but again no problems here i think i think i can confidently say let's uh move on from that yeah i mean yeah. I, I do like that they mentioned isaiah 44 as their first example mm. <laughs> which was yeah, our that, first example hilarious. too <laughs> yeah that's good that's right <laughs> yeah uh, that's good. And, and as we answered it we would say that this is uh excluding other distinct personal distinct substances and agencies uh, mm. substances being beings outside Yahweh beings that are numerically distinct from Yahweh and, and these are called idols right these are the sort of things that are excluded from the passage none of these idols are making things because Yahweh made them uh, he is the one who stretched out the heaven and the earth and all these objects are inert uh, However you want to interpret that, whether you want to say that divine council members are involved here, it's very, very clear that only Yahweh uh, is the creator. Uh, yeah, I mean, skipping skipping on to this, this father and the son are two persons, amen. Yeah. Uh, yep. So then if the God is a single person and the father and the son are two persons, it follows only one of them, either the father and the son will be able to be the one God. Again, that does not... Uh oh, if the one God is a single person, yeah, we would just deny that. Yeah, it, it, it's coming from the faulty uh, conclusion that we had from the last slide, namely the God is one person. So, right. of course, we're not going to agree with that. Right. John 17, 3 explicitly identifies the Father with the only true God. Uh, sure, amen. Uh, again, yeah. as, as we argued, uh, if God is taken abstractly here, as I, I think we have grounds for saying that it is, uh, it's very clear that they're actually committing a fallacy. It would be something like, if Jesus were the Father, he would be the only true God. But Jesus is not the Father, therefore he's not the only true God. A parallel line of reasoning would be, uh, if uh, Jeff Bezos owned uh, the Lakers, he would be rich. But Jeff Bezos does not own the Lakers, therefore he's not rich. Right? It, it, it's the, the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Uh, and so, yeah, that, there's, there's problems with this line of inference that doesn't exclude Jesus being the only true God. Definitely. And, of course, as 
as the Nicene Creed reads, we believe in one God, the Father. You know, each person is, you know, the only true God. The Father is the only true God. The Son is the only true God. The Spirit is the only true God. All three persons are the same God. We're not, you know, I, I know Trinitarian apologists say the, this, the old, you know, all the time, but we're, we're not polytheists. We're not tritheists. Right. All right. So finishing out here, we, we're back at the, oh, well, back at we're, at, we're at the conclusion here. So maybe we want some final thoughts here and we can end this uh, discussion on the debate. Sure. So firstly, we showed that we agreed that God is not a man, essentially, uh, and doesn't change. Amen. Mm. Throwing out that Jesus, who is a man, is not the God of the Bible. Again, if they're trying to say that, that uh, God essentially is not a man and Jesus is Jesus as a man is not God essentially, amen. Like, that doesn't prove anything whatsoever. And their really, really weak sense of immutability would entail that uh, either Jesus is a sinner or Jesus is actually immutable. Uh, and again, this is an incredibly weak and unsophisticated sense of immutability that it, within the literature isn't really defended. Uh, secondly, we show that the roles that Jesus fills distinguish him from the one God, the Father, uh, presenting, uh, preventing him from being the God of the Bible. Sure, I mean, yes, uh, the Father did not become incarnate. Amen. Uh, thirdly, we showed that throughout the Bible, God and Jesus are spoken of, God here being uh, the uh, first person of the Trinity, are spoken of distinct and in a way that is incompatible with Jesus being the God of the Bible. We disagreed with that, and we showed why that wasn't the case. And fourth, we showed that the Bible reveals God as a single person identical with the Father. Uh, again, uh, we agree that God is, the divine essence is identical with the Father, but that doesn't exclude Jesus from being God because Jesus is also identical with the divine essence, but he is not identical with the Father. Again, I, we agree that this could appear mysterious. We think that there's good reasons for holding this tension and that the apparent contradiction is not actually there once you get into the meat of uh, God's essence. And so, yeah, yeah. with that, we close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I just say on, on, that, on that fourth point, uh, it, uh, along with all these other points, um, presenting core biblical truths and then making false inferences and deductions from them. And I think that really encapsulates the entirety of their argumentation in this debate. That's right. Good. Right. And to, to kind of close things out, during the cross-examination period, they mentioned Colossians 1. We presented our interpretation of it. Uh, well, we, we, we asked questions asking their interpretation. They seemed to think that this was a pointing. Uh, we argued that the uh, prepositions here used uh, in, uh, we think that by was the best way to understand these because in, uh, as an ablative of means, often has the uh, connotation of by means of. Yeah. Uh, this would be the sort of use that occurs in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, that uh, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Obviously, God, in some sense, did not dwell Christ, but that isn't really what's being discussed. Uh, we press them further on uh, the... Uh, penal substitution in the cross-examination, they seem to think that uh, God is able to forgive sins without uh, satisfaction. Uh, they appointed, they, they appeal to uh, Old Testament examples. We showed that these Old Testament examples didn't actually forgive sins. They were signposts and sacraments that pointed to Christ's true sacrifice. Uh, their cross-examination period, I don't really remember much from it. It was interesting. I think that we answered most things, maybe not in the way that they would like us to, but we uh, presented our systematic case for the Trinity. We closed the debate with our uh, case from Colossians 1, our case from the uh, multiplicity of verses of it appealed to Christ's divine nature, and we uh, appealed to penal substitution. Uh, they closed uh, hammering home their points, arguing that there's nothing that entails that Jesus is a God from these verses, and that this is actually, funnily enough, an evangelistic hazard, uh, because this this odd Trinity thing is really a roadblock in the way of us conversing with Muslims, for instance, which 
I thought was interesting. Uh, I can understand if that is a uh, idea that you have. Uh, if you do genuinely believe that, that God is unipersonal, uh, you would think that this is a roadblock in the way of evangelism with Islam. But uh, again, we think that this is an essential truth that is uh, really fundamental to the gospel, that God's love is infinite and magnified in his son. And we can worship his son because his son is God. And the question and answer period, we can skip over that. Yeah. And just like, just like you were saying in the final closing statement, I, uh, I finished off there and I pointed out on Unitarianism, we're still all dead in our sins. We have no propitiation for our sins that can, a person that can genuinely take the infinite wrath of a holy and just God. Um, as Paul says, we are among men the most pity. Um, and so I, I was quite glad I could look it all back to the gospel. Right. Yeah, uh, and, uh, yeah I, I think that fundamental doctrines like justification by faith, uh, the idea of penal substitution, the idea of the uh, Trinitarian uh, sealing of us uh, to the day of redemption, that the Holy Spirit has a role in applying salvation to us by creating faith in us, and the Son's work is accomplishing redemption, and the Father uh, forgives us on account of the Son's oblation. All of these ideas are, are deeply Trinitarian. And the, the gospel is just, it doesn't make sense without Trinitarianism. In fact, I think that if you uh, really, really look into uh, Socinianism, it, it does ultimately amount to a gospel other than the gospel that was uh, rediscovered and reinvigorated at the Reformation. Mm. And the only gospel that saves us uh, from our sins. That That's a fantastic reminder and a good word. And I think that's probably the best place for us to end our, our conversation now. And I think that really highlights to everyone listening, why do we bother talking about these issues? Why dig deep into uh, the issue of Jesus being the God of the Bible and the Trinity and these type of this, uh, things? What, as uh, Cameron and Merrick just mentioned, it gets to the gospel. It gets to our salvation, how we understand it, how we receive it, and how we can even just have it in general available to us. So Th thank you both for, for coming on right now, unpacking the, the statement from uh, Andrew and, and Brandon here. Of course, we're grateful for them for yeah. uh, being willing to come on the debate and make this available, I'm sure. Uh, while we're, we're critiquing it, I, like at the end of the day, this is their, their content and people are reading it, so I, I don't think uh, yeah. that's an issue. Their, their arguments are being presented as they presented it here. And uh, also, I thank will you. Say, yeah, go ahead. Just, 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 just to yeah. close, I... I by that last statement, I was not intending any ill will towards Andrew or Brandon. They're both Christian. Well, I won't say necessarily that they're that they're both gentlemen who uh, earnestly believe in what they're saying, and they were, couldn't be more accommodating to us. And I, I thank them for that. Yeah, and, and that's something I think uh, is a common theme. We we could have strong disagreements with them, and I think we can safely say gospel issue differences where we're, we're talking about heaven and hell stuff. But I think. In, in that debate, there was definitely a sense of mutual respect and decency while disagreeing at the hard issues. And that's something I could say thank you to the Gospel Truth channel. They always, uh, they have fantastic debates. <laughs> I'm thinking of the, as soon as I said that, the Black Hebrew Israelite one, which <laughs> wasn't the greatest one, but in general, fantastic debates that are great to follow with full of respect. And I think this debate was another one of those. So thanks to that channel and Marlon yeah. for hosting them. And Again, thanks to you two, uh, Merrick and Cameron, for coming on today and chatting with us. And I'll leave in the description down below a link to the debate, probably my interview with Cam again. And then uh, I'll probably, if it's okay, put your your response blogs there where you, where you unpack some of these issues further so that people can take a look at that and read it a bit more. And yeah. By the way, with that closing little remark I made about whether they were Christian, that was that was not intended to. I, I that was just a slip up. I <laughs> think that that if you hold the position uh, that I do and the position that they do, you, you come to the conclusion that they are fundamentally distinct positions, and that a different Christ is a fundamentally different Christ. Yeah, uh, and they should hold the same position about me uh, if they truly believe in what they're saying. Yeah, the, these issues aren't, aren't for joking around. This is, these are big deals and it's nice to discuss them, but we, we have to respect that these are serious issues that 
ought to be discussed with that that uh, that understanding and hopefully that mutual understanding that if we if we love one another and we're believing that you're believing in a different Christ, we should do our best effort to uh, present the truth and defend it well. Which I I'm so grateful that you guys have done that and are doing that. And I look forward to seeing more work from the both of you. Maybe some more debates or other things. But you two are definitely some of the smartest guys I know. I really appreciate you and uh, where you're going in life. So so keep it up. Keep uh keep defending the truth and learning more about it and sharing it with us. And hopefully I'll have you both on another time, maybe talk about other issues or the same one because man, you guys are wicked smart and I love sharing you with my audience. So thank you both again. And thank you to all the, the audience people who are watching this now. Thanks for watching. And uh, I hope it was helpful. So that's it for yeah. us today. So uh, I'll leave at that and you gentlemen can say goodbye to me and, and to Christian's yeah. colloquy audience. Yep. See you guys. It's been great. Man, thanks for having us on, Christian. Yeah, my Thank pleasure. You. Take care. God bless you, audience. <laughs> yep. <laughs>